Okay guys, so today we will finish up um, the lymphatic system and immunity. Really we've gone through the lymphatic system, so today we'll just talk a little bit about some of the additional ways um, that we help to defend the body against infection and disease. Um, really most of today will be spread on the non-specific ways. So when we talk about the body, we talk about all of the different um, body defenses that we have to help us resist infection, right? To help us resist illness as much as we possibly can. When we talk about all of these body defenses, we can break them up into two general categories or two kind of broad categories of defenses. Innate defenses and <coughs> adaptive defenses. And we'll see that our innate defenses are non-specific and our adaptive defenses are specific defenses. So, our innate defenses. What does innate mean? You're born with it, right? You just have it. Our innate defenses are present at birth. Okay, so for example, stomach acid, your skin, mucous membranes. You've got these things when you're born. You don't have to develop them in any way. Um, they are innate. They always work the same way. This is why we say they are non-specific. The non-specific defenses do what they do regardless of who the invader is. They do not recognize and fight against one specific type of antigen. They do not remember one specific type of antigen. They're not specific. Um, anytime anything abnormal comes, they do the same thing, no matter what. They don't recognize specific invaders. So they confer or they give us non-specific resistance, right? Just a general resistance against infection or general resistance against a disease. They're, they are not giving us an immunity to one specific thing. This is just non-specific. Um, again, these are really going to be most of the focus of today's lecture. Our adaptive defenses are things that we have to get, right? We have to adapt in order to develop these. We are not born with them. And we also call our adaptive defenses specific because they work against specific pathogens. So these include the activities of our T cells and B cells. Okay, so we've got lymphocytes written there, but it's specifically T cells and B cells. Remember our T cells and B cells recognize specific antigens, right? And then they divide and they make a bunch of new T cells or a bunch of new B cells that are all active against that one specific antigen. They make memory cells that remember that one specific antigen. They are specific, okay? And again, this is adaptive because you have to make this, right? You're not born with your memory B cells and memory T cells already formed. You've gotta make them in some way. Um, you've gotta see an antigen before you can learn to fight it when we talk about our specific defenses. This gives us specific resistance, which we typically call immunity. And this occurs only after Again, you actually see the antigen, hence it being adaptive, not innate. Um, once we see this antigen and we develop resistance or immunity to it, um, the, the actual coming in contact with the antigen can be accidental or intentional. So, I don't know, most of you guys are old enough to have gotten uh, chickenpox, right? How many of you guys got chickenpox? Okay, most of you guys. We vaccinate against it now. Right, so kids get vaccinated against chickenpox so that they don't get it. But most of you guys got the chickenpox. So if you got the chickenpox, right, you came in contact with an antigen, you had to suffer through the, the disease, um, your body fought it, you made memory cells that remembered it, and now you're probably immune to it, right? If you could go around somebody who has chickenpox and not get it, most people won't get it twice um, because your body has developed an immunity to it. So in that case, we call that an active immunity, and we say that it is naturally acquired. So a naturally acquired active immunity. It's naturally acquired because you just went out in nature and came in contact with the pathogen, right? Like that, that's not medication, that's not anything weird happening, you just go out in nature and get it. Um, and it's active immunity because your body had to actually go through the whole immune process. You have to make the antibodies. You have to make the memory cells. 
but your body goes through an active process to get immunity. Okay, so an example of naturally acquired active immunity um, is if you get chicken pox, okay, you go through the whole disease, then you develop immunity. Um, we can also have artificially, artificially acquired active immunity. So this is active immunity. So this means that your body is going through the process, right? You see an antigen, your B cells and T cells get activated, they divide, they make memory cells, you remember that antigen so you know how to fight it. But if this is artificially acquired, can you think of an example of artificially acquired active immunity? Vaccine, right? Flu shot, right? Vaccines. So what happens with vaccines is we artificially inject someone with a pathogen, right? This is not happening in nature. We take the pathogen, we take some sort of disease-causing organism and we inhibit it in some way. We can kill it so that it can't replicate and make you sick. We can extract just a little part of the antigen because that's really all your body needs to know how to fight it is the ID. Um, we can attenuate it or we can hurt it so that it can't cause full um, out disease in you. But we do something to it so that you don't have to go through the whole sickness, right? We just want you to see the antigen so that your body will learn how to recognize it and fight it. Um, so this is artificial. This is something we do in a lab. We make it, we artificially give it to you. So it's artificially acquired, but it's still active because your body has to go through the process of activating cells and making all of these components. It, it is still a process. Um, we do have passive immunity. So we can have naturally acquired passive immunity and we can also have artificially acquired passive immunity. Okay, never mind my, I don't want to write the whole word. Um, passive immunity occurs when your body does not go through the whole process of activating T cells and B cells and plasma cells and making antibodies. You do not go through that whole process. You just get the antibodies. Okay, so you skip all of that activation and the antibodies are just given to you. Now this can happen naturally or artificially. Anybody, especially who have had kids, tell me about um, how we could naturally give somebody antibodies? Breast milk. Breast milk. Right? When you breastfeed, you can give your antibodies to your baby. Right? That's a natural process. Well, you can do something artificial about it. It's completely natural, but it is passive. Right? You're giving antibodies to the baby. The baby's immune system is not making them. Um, artificially acquired passive immunity, we do, we can inject antibodies. Um, remember we talked about Rogam? Those antibodies get rid of the Rh antigen. Um, we can inject antibodies directly into people. Um, that's obviously artificially acquired. That is something that's made in the lab that we're then giving to someone. And it's passive because their immune system's not doing any work whatsoever. So today, though, I said that we're going to really concentrate on the non-specific defenses or the innate defenses because really we've talked about lymphocytes a lot, right? We've talked about B cells and T cells and how we activate them with antigen presentation and how they divide and form memory cells and, and uh, antibodies and we, we've really talked about all of that. So today is really going to go through all of the innate or non-specific defenses that we have that also help to keep us um, healthy and free of disease. So we'll talk through each of these individually, um, but we'll talk about physical barriers. So things like skin, hair, mucous membranes, all of these physical components we have to try and keep the bad stuff out. Um, we'll talk about the leukocytes that, um, that <clears throat> do or perform phagocytosis. So things like macrophages, neutrophils, eosinophils, that can phagocytize things that get past our barriers. Um, immunological surveillance is something that occurs because of our NK cells, our natural killer cells. We'll talk about interferons, which are extremely important in the fight against viruses. Um, complement proteins, which help antibodies. And then also inflammation and fever. 
these we don't need to go through. These are just pictures of all of this, but we're going to go through all of it in a lot of detail. You want them to there. Okay, so we'll start by talking about physical barriers. Again, physical barriers seem really simple, um, but they're extremely important. And these are just the things that keep pathogens out. Right? We have a lot of different mechanisms that try and keep bacteria, viruses, fungus, whatever, from entering into our body. Um, the first and kind of major thing here is the epidermis, right? our skin. Our skin is an amazing barrier. Right? If you remember when we did the integumentary system, there's a lot of different things about the skin that are important. Um, remember that the cells are packed closely together. Right? You've got layer upon layer upon layer of cell packed very closely together. Um, what are the cells linked by? Desmosomes. Cells linked by desmosomes. And some of the deeper layers you see, again, the cells are interlinked together. We've got those little protein connectors. We always refer to them as like staples that link the cells together to form this nice, tight, strong junction between them. Um, the cells are packed with what? What protein? Epsilon. With keratin. Um, keratin is protected for a lot of re reasons. One, it's really strong. It resists abrasion because every time you cut or puncture or scrape the skin, things can get through, right? So it helps to protect from that because of all this cross-linked keratin. But remember, keratin is also water resistant. So I can put my hands on soapy water and wash dishes and everything that's in that soapy water doesn't automatically cross into my body. I can go swimming in the ocean with whatever bacteria that are there and they don't automatically cross through my skin into my body. Um, the, the keratin provides a really nice <coughs> water resistant barrier to help keep things out of the body. So the epidermis is a great barrier for us. Um, mucous membranes. Mucous membranes, remember, line the tracts. So the GI tract, the respiratory tract, the reproductive tract, the urinary tract. All of our tracts are lined with mucous membranes. Mucus is sticky, right? So it helps to trap anything that might make its way into one of the holes, right? The tracts are entryways to the body. So like your mouth, your nasal cavity, your esophagus, your um, trachea, the vagina, the anus, the urethra, whatever. These are all entryways where bad things can get in. So by lining these mucous membranes, uh, lining these tracts with coats of mucus, we help to kind of trap any bad thing that might make its way in. Hair and cilia are important for a couple different reasons. Hair, remember, acts as kind of a filter. Right, like the hair in your nose. When you, if you've ever gone to like cut the grass or done something outside and you blow your nose and there's it's gross, right? There's like dirt in that mucus uh, or dirt in, in your nose because you, you trap really big particles in your hair. Um, that's why you got hair in the groin, right? That's an entryway. You want to trap anything. If you imagine running around naked in the woods back before we had all of our designer clothing. Um, I always sound like a freak when I talk about running naked in the woods. Um, <clears throat> Because a long time ago, we didn't have clothes, not because it was by choice. Um, it's important to keep pathogens out of the vagina, out of the urethra, um, and the hair helps to do that. Um, your, your eyelashes, right, form a nice cage around your eyes to help keep pathogens out of your eyes. So that hair is a good, a good filter. Celia, remember, moved the mucus across the surface of cells. So it's all great and dandy that we line our respiratory tract with all this mucus, and that mucus traps all the bad stuff we breathe in. But imagine if we had no cilia, right? What would happen? You've got all this mucus lined in your trachea and your bronchi, and you trap bacteria, and then gravity pulls it straight down into your lungs, right? So you're essentially trapping bad stuff and then putting it exactly where you don't want it. So the mucus only works in conjunction with the cilia in our respiratory tract. Remember the cilia are like little hair-like extensions on the surface of cells? When you look at them um, superficially, like with the microscope, it looks like a shag carpet. There are little hairs sticking up everywhere, and they move. They do this. So they literally will, will kick the mucus up, up, 
up away from your lungs. And that's when you kind of feel that tickle in your throat and you <clears throat> try to keep pulling it out and you can spit it out. You can swallow it down to the acidity of your stomach. You can do whatever you want. But the point is that, that the bad stuff that's trapped in the mucus is not sitting down in your lungs because of those cilia. Uh, we have a lot of secretions present in the body. We've got secretions that flush to kind of just flush away the materials. And we have secretions that actually kill the uh, microorganisms. So as far as flushing, perspiration, your sweat, sweat flushes out your pores, um, the little, you know, little passageways or little holes that are present in the epidermis. It also flushes the surface of the skin. The lacrimal apparatus, what does that produce? <laughs> Tears. Right? Remember your lacrimal bone is this little one right here? Um, the lacrimal apparatus involves the glands and ducts that are involved in producing tears. Tears flush your eyes out, right? Our eyes should always be moist. And if anything starts to get in your eye, what happens? It flutters, right? You start producing more and more tears to try and flush whatever that was away. Um, we mentioned mucus. Mucus, again, is really important for lining all of the traps. And that allows us to, it's, it's sticky and it traps anything that we like inhale or whatever. Um, urine is extremely important, right? Why do they tell women to, to urinate after having sex? Right? Bacteria get pushed into the urethra. What does urine do? Flush the urethra. Okay, I've got a nice flushing action to push whatever gets put up into the urethra out. Um, vaginal secretions, same things, help to flush out the vagina. Um, and then defecation and vomiting. So when you eat, sometimes you eat stuff that you shouldn't. Right? There might, you might have food that sat out too long and it's got bacteria in it. Or a lot of food poisoning is actually caused because of the toxins that the bacteria make, not the bacteria themselves. So you eat something bad and it's in your stomach, the way that we get rid of it is by vomiting. Right? It's not fun, but it works to really quickly get those bad toxins out of your body. So that's very protective. Um, if it gets past your stomach and we don't notice it until it's down in the intestines, we can't come up anymore. Right? So then we go down um, and that stimulates defecation. When we rush things through the intestines, we don't reabsorb water. So we get this really watery stool. So that's why you have diarrhea that's really liquidy and really watery. That just means you've got something bad in that stool that you need to get rid of. Um, so you're rushing everything through the intestines before those toxins can really hurt the body. Again, not fun, but protective. That's better than leaving the toxins in you and allowing them to cause harm. Again, some secretions actually kill or inhibit the growth of microorganisms. Um, our saliva, our sweat, and sebum, which remember is just our oil secretions, all have antimicrobial components. Okay, so some sort of a component that tries to kill um, bacteria or whatever microorganisms. Again, saliva, this makes sense why this is so important in the mouth, right? We're constantly putting bacteria in our mouth all day long. We have some bacteria like Streptococcus mucans, uh, or sorry, mutans. Streptococcus mutans is a bacteria that's responsible for cavities. Um, <clears throat> processes sugars into acids and gives us cavities. It just lives in your mouth. That's where it lives. Um, but we're constantly introducing bacteria into our mouth. So it's important to have antimicrobial properties in the saliva. Sweat, same thing, flushes out the skin. Sebum or oil is important for um, like your hair follicles and, and where your hair is growing from to try and decrease bacterial growth there. Stomach acid um, itself is just, it, it creates a very, very acidic environment in the stomach where most bacteria cannot live. When we do GI, we'll talk about um, H. pylori is one of the few bacteria that can live in your stomach um, and cause infection in your stomach, but most bacteria will die when they get into your stomach because it's filled with hydrochloric acid. It's a very, very acidic environment. And again, that's intentional. That is very protective because of all of the bacteria that we're constantly taking into the GI tract. Okay, but again, all of these things are physical, but um, physical barriers that try and keep pathogens out of the body. Um, and again, this is non-specific. It doesn't matter what it is. Your epidermis is always doing the same thing. Right? Your, your, your skin cells don't change depending on which pathogen is trying to enter. They just do what they do. Um, and this is innate. This is something that we're born with working. We don't have to develop it. It's, it's there. It is what it is.
So if microbes get past our physical barriers, our next line of nonspecific defense that we de depend on would be our leukocytes. What does leukocyte mean? White blood cells, right? So we would depend on our white blood cells except for our lymphocytes. Okay, remember our B cells and our T cells are specific defense. Okay, so we're not talking about those. The NK cells we'll talk about later in something called um, immunological surveillance. So here we're just talking about our other leukocytes. So that would be what? Neutrophils? Monocytes? I went S I G E. Like, seriously? Monocyte slash macrophage. Uh, what else? Eosinophil and apophils. Okay, so all of our other leukocytes, our non specific leukocytes. Most of these, not basophils, okay, but everything else, has the ability to act as the phagocyte. Right, so neutrophils, eosinophils, and our monocyte macrophage combo. All of those cells can act as phagocytes. So they can engulf, right, and then break down and destroy any abnormal target, whether that's bacteria, one of our cells that's old, a virus infected cell. Um, we can break them down with these other types of leukocytes. The basophil, remember, is not phagocytic. Um, that's the one white blood cell that does not have that ability to engulf pathogens, but it helps out the phagocytes, right? It's got a couple of different mechanisms to kind of stimulate that immune response, even though it's not actually engulfing things itself. Um, it helps to aid in the mobility of all of the other white blood cells. And the way that it does that is by releasing leukotrienes, histamine, and heparin. Leukotrienes just attract other white blood cells to the area. What do we call that? Positive hemotaxis. Excellent. Positive hemotaxis. Okay, so basal pills will just start to release leukotrienes and that calls all of the other fighters to the area. Hey, we've got a problem, right? Like a little red flashing light. We want everybody else to come. And then because we know we're going to be rushing a lot of other white blood cells to the area, we try and increase that mobility. Right, we increase the amount of blood that we can rush to the area. We do that with histamine and heparin. Histamine, remember, causes inflammation. Right, so histamine is why basophils cause inflammation. And that's because the histamine dilates blood vessels, right, makes the blood vessel bigger, and it also increases their permeability. So that brings a bunch of blood to the area and it makes it really easy for the white blood cells to cross in and out of the bloodstream so that they can go into whatever infected tissue it is. Um, again, that happens to cause inflammation and we'll see at the end of the lecture that inflammation itself is protective. Like this is a good positive thing. Um, they also release heparin. Heparin prevents blood clots. If you think about it, if you're rushing a bunch of blood to an area, the last thing you want is for the blood to start kind of coagulating and clotting because then the white blood cells get stuck in that clotted area. Okay, so the heparin prevents that blood clotting so that as you rush all the blood to the area, the white blood cells don't get you know, stuck up in any of those chunks. So we know that phagocytes are cells that engulf any pathogen or old, worn out cell, anything foreign, all right, they're cell eaters. So things that engulf anything that shouldn't be there. When we talk about our white blood cells that act as phagocytes, we can classify them as microphages and macrophages. Macrophages we talked about, right? We keep talking about monocytes enter the periphery and then we call them macrophages. Um, so macrophages are these big phagocytic cells that come from monocytes, right? They typically go, um, they migrate through the tissues. Okay, so we find them migrating through our tissues, so not in the bloodstream. And again, they're really, really powerful phagocytes. They phagocytize really large things. Microphages refer to our smaller 
uh, phagocytes, our eosinophils and neutrophils. <clears throat> These typically circulate in the bloodstream. They do have the ability to leave the bloodstream. So if we have an infection present out in the tissues, we can call them to the area and they will leave, but they tend to be in the bloodstream. Okay, conversely, the macrophages tend to be out in the tissues. Um, when we look at neutrophils, neutrophils will phagocytize anything abnormal. Eosinophils will phagocytize antibody-marked bacteria. Okay, so we have to actually mark the bacteria with antibodies before the eosinophil will be able to, to phagocytize it. It kind of needs to be told, hey, this is something that needs to go. But the neutrophil, anything weird, it'll do. Same thing with macrophages, anything abnormal, it'll do. All phagocytes work in a pretty similar fashion and have some similar characteristics. Um, <clears throat> they all have the ability to leave the bloodstream, right? which we just said, the like neutrophils and eosinophils are typically in the blood, but they can leave, and monocytes like to leave and become macrophages. So they do have the ability to leave the bloodstream and enter into uh, our peripheral tissues. We call that emigration, right? when they actually go to the capillary walls, cause them to, to separate a little bit, or the endothelial cells to separate and leave, that's emigration. We mentioned this um, as well, that they can be called to certain areas with chemicals, right? Like we can release leukotrienes, and that will call white blood cells to the area. Um, we call that positive chemotaxis when they're attracted to an area. Um, <clears throat> technically, according to the book's definitions, it says that we can also repel them I honestly cannot think of a single instance when you would do that, like when you would repel white blood cells. But this is the definition in the book, so I'm gonna go with it. Um, but positive chemotaxis is a lot more common when we actually draw white blood cells to the area. And then when we look at the actual phagocytosis um, or cell eating, first we have adhesion occur. Okay, so the phagocyte doesn't just go around and just start enveloping things. It actually adheres, or the target binds to multiple receptor sites on the phagocyte, and that's kind of how the phagocyte says, okay, this is something that I should be engulfing, because it's gotta recognize that it's something abnormal um, before it just starts engulfing things. Um, after it adheres to multiple binding sites on the target, it then creates a vesicle right around the target and pulls it in. Remember, anytime we bring something within the cell in a vesicle, we call that endocytosis. Endo is within, cyto is the cell. So pulling it into the cell is endocytosis. If we're talking about a solid, it's phagocytosis. What was it called if you pull in a liquid? Chemocytosis. Once we pull the target in, at that point we can digest it. And the different phagocytes do this in different ways. Like remember we talked about the macrophage, um, the macrophage actually had to be told, right, that it could actually destroy the target. Um, that's not the case with the eosinophil. So they, they all do this in a little bit different way with different steps that are involved, but eventually it does digest and degrade the target. <clears throat>